This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Good morning, and thanks for joining me here today on Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit. I'm your host, Josie Bidwell, Professor of Preventive Medicine and Nurse Practitioner at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. And today we're going to be answering some of your questions that have come in through email or social media. And Southern Remedy producer Kevin Farrell is going to be helping me out with these questions. Before we jump into that, uh, Josie, uh, uh, sharp-eared listeners might have noticed (laughs) that you said professor and not associate professor. Correct. So some congratulations are in order. Yes, thank you very much. That is the culmination of 15 years of of work in uh, as a faculty member and um, so that's a, an exciting milestone to have, but I'm not done yet. Uh keep uh keep doing good work for the state of Mississippi. Very good. All right, so this first question says, I just got put on blood pressure medication. Should I check my blood pressure at home? Well, it's an excellent question and one that For the majority of people, I'm going to say yes. Uh, So I'm a big proponent of knowing your numbers and knowing what is going on in our body. And so um, especially when we've got changes in treatment, right? So if we have just recently gotten put on blood blood pressure medication, then we want to look at How is our body responding to that? And obviously, you can go into your healthcare provider's office and get those things done, but that usually is um, spaced out a little bit. So a lot of times when we start blood pressure medications on folks, we'll, depending on the medication type, we'll bring them back in in about two weeks, sometimes four weeks, and see um, if we've made progress in that blood pressure. Um, But checking at home is a great way to start to see how the medication is impacting your blood pressure. And then there's also that category of folks who have what we call white coat hypertension or where we just get a little bit uh, anxious when we go into a healthcare provider's office and our blood pressure may kind of be um, falsely elevated or, you know, it's just showing up as higher in your healthcare provider's office. And What we want to make sure there is that it is an isolated event, that it's just happening when you're in your healthcare provider's office, that it's not running high all the time. You know, we talk about high blood pressure on the show a lot and that it's doesn't have a lot of symptoms uh, when we have high blood pressure, but it's absolutely doing not great things inside of our body. I usually talk about blood pressure and the blood vessels and all those kinds of things like a roadway and that our blood vessels are are like uh, you know streets and highways and interstates and all these kinds of things delivering uh, nutrients around to the body and when our blood pressure is staying too high it's kind of like the roadways get congested and get get stopped up a little bit and that strains the blood vessels and can actually um, make them get stiffer uh, which is not good for all the organs that are that the blood's trying to get to. So kidney problems, eye problems, brain problems, all of those different types of things. So we truly want to know what your blood pressure is doing when you're not at the healthcare provider's office, because that's where you spend the majority of your time is is not in our office. So keeping um, a log is the second piece. So you asked, uh, should you check your blood pressure at home? Yes. And the second piece of that is write it down somewhere. Uh, Most blood pressure machines have a memory function on them if it's one of the automated machines, and we'll kind of keep track of it. But that's hard to see trends for yourself, right? That's hard for you to go, what was it yesterday? I got to look back through the memory. So actually writing it down is a great way for you to see what your blood pressure is doing. And then also just to bring that with you to your healthcare provider's office so that we can see those trends as well. Now, data is only as good as how we collect it. So we want to make sure that we're checking our blood pressure at home accurately. And that starts with making sure that we have a good machine in which to do that. And if you Google uh, home blood pressure machines, you're going to come up with a whole bunch of different options there. And if you have the option to choose, I would choose an arm cuff over a wrist cuff. Just because wrist cuffs tend to overestimate blood pressure a little bit doesn't mean they can't be used. And if you've got mobility issues and that's kind of, 
you know, all you feel like you can can use and get on, that's fine. It's absolutely better than nothing. But if you do have the option to choose, then an arm cuff would be my preference there. <clears throat> And we want to make sure that the cuff is the correct size. If you're not sure, you can always ask your healthcare provider kind of how to measure your arm and look at those different kinds of things. But we want it to be um, big enough to go around your arm comfortably where the Velcro doesn't pop off when it becomes inflated. And then also that um, the width of it. So that's the length I'm talking about. But then the width of it is wide enough for your arm. And so that's going to depend on how, how big your arm is. Um, most of them come standard with just a regular adult cuff, but we may need a large adult or a small adult cuff, um, depending on the size of our arm. And those can be ordered um, to, to interchange out with those. So that's the first step is, is making sure we got the right size cuff. And the reason that matters is if you use too big of a cuff for your arm, it will make your your blood pressure look falsely lower than it is. And so you'd be like, oh, my blood pressure is doing great. But it's actually not as controlled as we would like for it to be. And if you're using too small of a cuff, it puts a little too much squeeze on the arm and can make the blood pressure look higher than it actually is. And so we certainly don't want to be adjusting medications and giving you more medication for a, a falsely uh, high blood pressure. Some of my other tips for getting a really good and accurate blood pressure reading at home is to make sure that we are not talking while the blood pressure machine is going. And that happens a lot. You know, I do a lot of telehealth work uh, in lifestyle medicine clinic. And sometimes patients will be like, I'm going to check my blood pressure while I'm on with you. That's great. But we're not going to talk to each other while you're doing that because that can make your blood pressure go up. So I'm not being mean. Um, I absolutely want to talk to you, but I want you to be, be quiet while we're checking your blood pressure so that we get the most accurate reading there. Also, if you just came in from working in the garden and plopped down, now is not the time to check your blood pressure. We need to rest at least five minutes um, of, of good rest to let, that, let your blood pressure kind of calm down a little bit. We also don't want to be eating and drinking or smoking while we're taking our blood pressure. That also can make our blood pressure go up. Uh, and then the position of our arm and how we're sitting are the other two really big ones. So you want to be kind of in a, a some type of uh, seated area that has a back on it. So like a chair with a back on it so that you can relax your back into that chair. Um, feet flat on the ground. If we cross our ankles, cross our legs, which that is something that's so common for me when I sit down, it's like a default. I kind of cross my legs. Uh, and so I always have to be conscious of making sure that I uncross those when I'm getting my blood pressure checked. Um, so feet flat on the ground, not crossed. Again, that can make the blood pressure look higher than it actually is. And then where your arm is, the arm that has the cuff on it, we don't want it dangling down by our side and we don't want it pointing up toward the sky. You want it about even with your heart, so about even with your chest. So usually like your kitchen table is a good spot. Um, usually a kitchen chair has got a nice uh, flat bottom and a nice flat back that you can sit in and then rest your arm on the kitchen table. Uh, and be able to check your pressure that way. Once you check it and you get your number, we want you to kind of wait a little bit and check it again. So two checks um, at, at that time, but not immediately after. You want to give it one to one to three minutes or so in between those checks. Now, some healthcare providers will tell you to average those two numbers together. I don't do that. I just want you to write down the first check and the second check, and then I can look at those and see, see what's going on there. And then talk to your healthcare provider about how many times a day they want you to check. I'm really super happy if I can get people to consistently check every day. Um, but Checking twice a day gives us even a little bit more information, especially when we're just starting a medication or we, we've had a medication change, like maybe we've upped the dose or something like that. And so that's a in the morning uh, check and then usually in the afternoon, evening times. Usually that morning one is going to be before you've had your medicine, so you may see it be a little bit higher. And then in the afternoon, um, we should see your medicine kind of taking full effect as well as that's when our body normally starts to decrease blood pressure. So our blood pressure starts to rise in the morning as we're waking up and kind of peaks around lunchtime and then starts to decline a little bit um, over in the afternoon. So having those two pieces lets us have a really good picture of what's going on um, with your blood pressure. 
The other thing is bring your blood pressure cuff, your machine with you to your healthcare provider's office at least once a year and let us do what's called calibrating it and making sure that the number that we're getting in the office is the same as the number you're getting on your machine at home. So if you come in to see us and we check your blood pressure and it's 150 over 90 and your machine, we run it at the same time and it says 150 over 90, then we can kind of trust what your readings are at home on that. If it comes back and says, you know, 90 over 50, then something's not, no, something's not right there. And we need to work on that machine to make sure that um, the thing, all the hard work you're doing at home is being um, accurately measured and reflected. All right. So that was a lengthy answer on that really short question. But I feel like that's some important things to think about as we're checking blood pressure because we want to get it. We want to get it right so that we can make decisions off of those things. listening to Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit on MPB Think Radio. I'm your host, Josie Bidwell, nurse practitioner at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. And today we're going through all the emails and questions that I get on basic health and wellness. And Southern Remedy producer Kevin Farrell is helping me with these questions today. That's right, Josie. Our next one says, I'm frustrated. I've been working on losing weight. I weigh every day at home. And even when I feel like I've had a good day, my weight still goes up. Do I need to eat less? Ooh, well, I don't know what you're eating, so it's hard for me to say um, on that. But based on experience, um, that's probably not the most sustainable strategy. And so let's kind of uh, break this down a little bit. And it's, you know, it seems I had a bunch of questions that came in about checking things at home, like checking your blood pressure, checking your weight, those types of things. And while I do want you checking your blood pressure uh, at home every day, uh, weighing every day may not be the correct strategy, right? And so there's a couple of reasons why. The biggest reason is the fact that your weight fluctuates day to day by as much as five pounds. And you're like, that's a lot. Well, it depends on uh, what time of the day we're weighing, whether we've worked out or not, what types of foods we've eaten, whether we've gone to the bathroom, um, what uh, time of the year it is, whether it's summer, winter, fall, spring. Uh, And then um, if we're uh, still having uh, cycles where we are in in our menstrual cycle as well. Uh, Because if we think about what a scale is measuring, right? It's measuring how much something weighs. It's not measuring what that weight is made up of. And so that can be water, it can be bone, it can be muscle tissue, and it can be fat tissue. And when we think about what you would need to take in, in terms of calories to gain a certain amount, let's take, for instance, five pounds. Let's say the scale is five pounds heavier today than it was yesterday. So a pound of, of body, of fat, is 3,500 calories. And so to gain even a pound from one day to the next of fat tissue, right, which is what most of us think about when we get on the scale, we're like, this is, this is fat, you know. Um, to gain a pound of fat tissue, you would need to have had 3,500 more calories than what your maintenance calorie is. So, you know, for just for sake of, of an example, if if 2,000 calories is what we need to maintain our weight, you would have need needed to have consumed 3,500 more calories than that 2,000 calories. So 5,500 calories yesterday for that to be a true pound um, gain. That is exceedingly hard to do, to eat that, that number of calories. So when I'm working with folks and they've had, you know, a couple of pounds shift in the scale from one day to the next – that's not fat tissue that you've gained, right? It uh, can depend on you know any number of those things I just talked about, but in particular, if you've had saltier meals or um, even more carb-heavy meals, that may make us hang on to a little bit more water. Um, if we're weighing at the end of the day, then that's a culmination of all the things that we've had to eat that day and how much we've had to drink and you know whether we've had a bowel movement and all these other different kinds of things. So if we're going to weigh, I would not weigh at the end of the day, um, unless that's a number that your healthcare provider is 
past for maybe if you've got kidney disease or congestive heart failure or something like that. Um, but for for your average person, if we're wanting to weigh to kind of keep um, a gauge on our uh, on how much we weigh, then first thing in the morning after we've gone to the bathroom without any clothes on is going to be your most accurate and on the same scale. So not, you know, the scale in your upstairs bathroom one day and the scale in your downstairs bathroom the next day. Uh, it needs to be the same scale naked after we've been, after we've used the restroom, whether that be, you know, urination or bowel movement or both. Um, and that'll give us a little bit more more accurate picture. And then I usually don't recommend weighing more than once a week because you will see those fluctuations from day to day, about 5% um, difference from day to day uh, based on all those things we've already talked about. So if you're really wanting to track and, you know, keep track of those things um, every week is um, a, a better marker of that. I usually also don't recommend people do it on Monday morning because uh, the weekend is often when we've been out of our habit a little bit that we established for ourselves during the week. And so we may have had um alcohol over the weekend. We may have had saltier, more, you know, takeout type foods, that type of thing. And so that may contribute to some, some water weight. And so, um, any, any day other than Monday is usually a good day to check in there. And again, just once, uh, once per week. Now, if even that is demotivating to you, then don't, way. Um, you know, the number on the scale is a piece of information, but it certainly doesn't tell the whole picture of uh, the work that you're putting in for your overall health. Um, there can be other things that you use, how well your clothes fit. Um, you can also do different uh, body measurements like a waist circumference um, or a waist to hip circumference, all of those different types of things that can show you um, change kind of in your body composition. So where, where you're where you're carrying your weight and moving it away from kind of the central area uh, is a great uh, way to lower your cardiovascular risks. So um, don't weigh every day. And if you, when you do weigh, same scale, same time of the day, about once a week is all I recommend there. And the, the notion of, well, I'll just eat less um, eventually uh, becomes non-sustainable because you get to a point where you've cut so many calories out. You've also cut out all the joy uh, and there's nowhere uh, kind of to, to go on that. So probably not eating less um, as the initial response to that scale. All right, Josie, here's number three. It says, um, I'm so exhausted all the time. When I come home from work, I just want to lay down and sleep. Would a vitamin help? Ah, so this is probably one of the more common questions that I get through um, social media as well as in the clinic. And I think it's important that we kind of break it down into what could be contributing to fatigue or this exhaustion, right? So the first thing as a medical provider, I'm going to look at, are there any um, disorders that could be going on that I need to check for and then treat? And that's where vitamins or supplements may come in, right? So the first thing I'm going to look at is our blood counts and see if we may be anemic because being anemic can make us feel super fatigued and tired because usually when we say anemia, we're talking about iron deficiency anemia. Iron is important for us transporting our oxygen all around our bodies and those types of things. So I'm going to look there. Um, and then I may actually look at iron levels if anything on that blood count looks a little weird. Um, and then things like vitamin B12, folate, vitamin D, those are going to be ones that I'm going to look at. And then your thyroid, so to, to look for things like hypothyroidism. And so after that first kind of initial set of blood work, then we think about, you know, do we have any type of heart issues, right? Do I have um, chest pain or shortness of breath? Um, do, have I had an EKG lately? All of those different kinds of things. If all of that checks out normal, then we're going to look at what are our habits and what are the things that could be contributing to feeling just worn down all the time, right? And the most common things I see when we've ruled out, you know, a deficiency in something or something with our heart or something with um, our thyroid going on is we're not eating enough calories. We're not drinking enough liquids. We're not sleeping enough. And we are stressed out. 
right? And I know that probably sounds like no one. You're like, absolutely not. I'm well hydrated and stressless. Uh, but that is uh, not the case usually when we really start to dig down into these things. And if you think about your body um, as kind of, again, being a machine or a car or however you want to think about that, if we don't put gas in the car, if we don't change the oil, um, if we don't get the tires rotated, all of these different kinds of things, the car continues to go, but it certainly doesn't go as uh, effectively and as efficiently as it would had we done all the maintenance on it. And if we think about our health habits like those pieces of maintenance, then it's kind of easier to connect the dots between what we're eating, drinking, sleeping, and our mental health, and then how we actually feel from an energy standpoint. Um, if we're not eating enough calories, that is like not putting gas in the car because calories are fuel. So one of the first things we do is take a look and, and just kind of see are we eating at regular intervals during the day or are we not eating until, you know, late afternoon, evening time? Well, it, there's no wonder we're, we're tired and sluggish during the day if we're, if we're not giving our body any nutrients or any hydration. Um, and so that hydration piece comes in second, right? If we're not um, drinking enough liquids, primarily water, then again, we're dehydrated and everything is going to gonna slow down. So it's like not having enough um, left oil in the car, right? Everything kind of um, slows down. The engine's eventually going to not do what it's supposed to do. I'm not a car person, so I don't know what the engine, I mean, I know what the engine does, but I don't know what, what happens, but it doesn't go good. So we have to have hydration. Um, and then sleep seems pretty fairly explanatory, right? If we're not sleeping well, then that does contribute to feeling exhausted. Um, a lot of times people overestimate the amount of sleep that they're getting because they kind of count any time in bed as sleep. And so they'd be like, well, I get in bed at seven o'clock as soon as I get home, you know, and I'm still exhausted in the morning. Well, what time did you actually go to sleep? You know, was that midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., those types of things? How many times did you wake up during the night? Um, all of those things factor in, right? And so if you don't feel like you're um, resting well at night or you're sleeping for the correct amount of time, that kind of seven to nine hour time, and you're still feeling exhausted in the morning, then that kind of leads me to go, well, what's going on during sleep? Are we not getting into the correct stages of sleep, which can be related to medication side effects or um different uh, things that we're doing, you know, consuming alcohol right before bed will mess with the, the sleep staging and that kind of thing. Um, certain medications that we take can also do that. And then different sleep disorders like sleep apnea, restless leg, those types of, of situations. And so um, really looking at the sleep is important. And then that stress. We tend to not give our mental health as much credit for how we feel physically. Uh, and having a lot of anxiety, depression, um, or just daily stressors that we're having trouble dealing and coping with can make us feel very, very tired and very fatigued. Um, in fact, when I'm uh, working with new patients, very rarely does somebody say, you know what, I think I'm depressed. They'll say, you know, I'm just, I don't want to get up and do anything. Um, you know, I used to enjoy doing those things, but I just don't have the energy for it now. And that kind of clues us in to look a little bit more for things like depression. Or they say, you know, I'm, I can't go to sleep at night because my mind is racing and I can't get it to cut off, all of those different kinds of things. And so we really want to look, you know, are we, are we eating? Are we drinking enough fluids? Are we sleeping and having restful sleep? Uh, and and are we dealing with our stress and our, our mental health? And so it seems like a lot, and it, and it is, right? It's, it's every facet of our health, and that doesn't mean we have to overhaul everything overnight, but we do want to start being intentional about those things. So if you find yourself not eating during the day, maybe go, you know, I could take... Um, some fruit and a yogurt with me to work and have something midday and see if that helps me have that kind of finish the last of the day without feeling like I'm just going to pass out. Or instead of reaching for that coffee in the afternoon, which is so common for us to do, maybe we reach for a water or a decaffeinated something um, so that we can get a little bit more hydration that way. Maybe we look at... Um, cutting the TV off in the bedroom at night so that we 
have it nice and dark and quiet and cool in there and maybe get a little bit more uh, duration of quality sleep. Um, But just picking somewhere and getting started, that's the biggest piece of advice there is um, just do something. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be eight to 10 glasses of water, just a little bit more than you drank the day before um, is a really good strategy for starting to get hydrated. This is Southern Remedy, Healthy and Fit on MPB Think Radio. I'm your host, Josie Bidwell, nurse practitioner at UMMC. And we're going to go down to Hattiesburg and say, good morning, Robert. How can I help you? Uh, good good morning. Good morning. I've uh, been listening to you about uh, blood pressure and fatigue and mm-hmm. sleeping habits and things like that. What What's your point of view on CPAP machines? Uh, almost every, not not almost, but I, I would say 30 to 40% of the people I know in their 60s and 70s mm-hmm. are using these mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. I personally think they're overprescribed and, and, and kind of a, something that's trendy. Um, just what do they, what do they really, 20 years ago, it was rare for people to use them. Now right. they're all over the place. Right. And they're selling cleaning devices and everything else for them on television. What what is your point of view yeah. on CPAP machines as as a healthy lifestyle device? Yeah. Well, the at the crux of it, it's we've got to get restorative sleep. So if we've got obstructive sleep apnea and anything over mild sleep apnea, then figuring out how best to treat that is going to have significant health benefits, right? If we think about sleep in general, there are a variety of things that occur while we are sleeping. So it's not kind of a, um, a just a lack of being awake, which is sometimes what we feel like sleep is. Um, from a, um, a brain health standpoint, it's where kind of um, waste products are kind of cleaned up during that time. From a cardiovascular standpoint, it's where um, blood vessels get to relax a little bit, which means blood pressure gets to go down. Um, from a uh, metabolic standpoint, if we're not sleeping well for whatever reason, then that can make our cortisol levels stay a little bit higher, which can make our blood sugar levels be higher, can make us kind of hang around to wait around that midsection a little bit more. Um, It can increase our risk for like um, atrial fibrillation, those types of things, as well as other um, cardiovascular events if we've got you know untreated sleep apnea, those types of things. Um, From a food and nutrition standpoint, It can uh, make us feel not satisfied um, so that we kind of feel like we need multiple snacks during the day for whatever reason. And it's usually not super well balanced snacks that our brain is is looking for and craving. It's um, salty or sweet or both um, because the brain is feeling kind of deprived because it didn't rest. And so there are multiple causes for non-restorative sleep. Uh, The kind of lowest hanging fruit is just our sleep hygiene and whether we are setting ourselves up for success in terms of sleep, meaning we're not using screens in the, in the bedroom or wherever we're sleeping, um, that we've got it nice and cool. We've got it dark um, and that we're getting that seven to nine hours and feeling rested in the morning. If we're not, then we've got to look for a reason for that. And sleep apnea is one of the more uh, common uh, disorders that we, we find there. And so to the point of, we're seeing them much more often. Um, that's hopefully, and what I believe is we're asking more often about how people are sleeping, which is really important for our overall health. So the fact that we are having those conversations with patients about, or with people that are coming to see us about, and you tell me about your sleep, how are you sleeping? And then doing the appropriate workup um, is encouraging because we we need to know what's going on with folks so that we can better treat them. Now, in terms of um, the different disorders that we can find, there's sleep apnea, like we mentioned, there's restless leg, you know, other there are obviously other things like um, um, night terrors and those types of things that can be going on. From a CPAP standpoint, what is it actually doing? So if we look... Um, 
in in the mouth, uh, into the the back of the throat, like when your healthcare provider says open wide and say ah, right? One of the things that we're looking at other than just you know, what your tonsils look like and that kind of stuff is how much of the very back of your throat we can see, right? So can I see your uvula, the little hangy down thing, but also can I see the back wall of of your throat, right? Because that essentially is the start to our airway, right? Um, It it starts to connect right, right back there. If I can't see any of that while you're awake, alert, and sitting up, then what is happening to that airway when you're laying down flat and you lose muscular tone, right, which is what happens when we sleep? Um, That airway can kind of collapse or those tissues can kind of flop in over the top of that, and that can lead to sleep apnea, right? And so what's happening with that is you're either not breathing as deeply as you need to or you're pausing breathing, or a combination of those. And it's usually a combination of those. We call that apnea hypopnea index. And that tells me how many times per hour that happens. And so if we've got somebody that that's happening five or six times an hour, okay, we may can support that with positioning devices, like maybe we can get an adjustable bed to help sit up and take some of the gravitational pressure off of it. Maybe we can use a wedge pillow or bed risers or something like that. Um, But, you know, I mean, I had someone the other day whose apnea hypopnea index was 85. That means 85 times per hour, they either didn't breathe as deeply or paused breathing. That's more than once a minute. So when we think about what's going on from a a rest standpoint, that individual is never able to get into the different stages of sleep and spend long enough in those stages to get good restorative benefit. So their heart doesn't rest as well as it needs to. The blood pressure stays higher than it needs to. Blood sugar stays higher. And it's harder to adhere to maybe a calorie restricted diet if we're trying to lose weight or a a lower um, refined carb diet if we're trying to manage our blood sugar, those different types of things. So it all is going to kind of depend on what the score is and then what is the clinical picture. And if we don't want to do a CPAP, which is it stands for continuous positive airway pressure, it's just going to blow air into um, the upper airway to hold it open so that you can continue to take breaths like you like you should without that airway kind of collapsing down. If we don't want to do CPAP, then we're going to have to get really creative with positioning devices to try and help with that. Or one of the, uh, the newer um, procedure called Inspire, which is an implantable device which actually stimulates one of the nerves to open the airway. Um, so I know it can seem like they're they're overprescribed or that just everybody is using them. One, we have to think about um, the fact that we're asking more people and then um, also that a higher weight is associated with greater risk of having sleep apnea. And we do know that we're continuing to have, you know, higher rates of, of being overweight um, than, than we used to. So kind of all those things together. So at the end of the day, you have to, if we've got trouble sleeping, we have to come up with a strategy, whether that's CPAP or whether that's some other uh, um, uh, dental device that can help hold the jaw a certain way, positioning devices that I talked about, but some way to get us to restorative sleep because it's so important. All right, Kevin, I think we've got time for one kind of short question before we hit this next break. What do you think? All right. Uh, This one is asking about percentages on food labels. I'm trying to be more conscious of what I put in my body, but I'm really confused about how to read those labels. Should I even be trying? Absolutely. I'm just proud of you for turning that thing around and looking at the back of it. So the percentages, what I want you to remember here, a couple of things. One is those percentages are based off a 2,000 calorie diet, right? So everything on that label, when it says this provides this percent of this nutrient, it's based on 2,000 calorie diet. And not everybody needs a 2,000 calorie diet. If we're um, trying to lose weight and we're a woman, we probably don't need quite that um, ca- that many calories. But I don't want you to get that hung up on it. The way I use the percentages is to tell whether this product is high in a nutrient or low in a nutrient. So if it is 5% or less on that food label, that particular food is considered low in that nutrient. 
If it is 20% or higher, it is considered high in that nutrient. And then everything between there is just kind of moderate in that nutrient. So if we think about things we need less of, so usually less saturated fat, less cholesterol, less sodium, less added sugars, right? Then we want to keep that as close to 5% or lower as we can. If we think about things we need more of, like fiber, right, or um, different um, micronutrients in things, like maybe their iron content or potassium, those kinds of things, 20% or above is going to tell me this is high in this particular nutrient. So one of the things, like if I'm comparing brands of something, maybe, maybe I'm going to get some potato chips, not the healthiest option in the world, but I really want some potato chips. I'm going to pick them up and flip them over and see which one has the better percentage in terms of fat and salt um, on this particular item. Um, Or I'll pick it up and go, whoo, this thing has 45% um, of my daily sodium content in it. That's a lot of salt for me to waste kind of on this one item. Does that fit with what else I'm doing in terms of the other things I'm going to be having at this meal or, or this snack? So it's just kind of a good thing to, to, to keep in mind that 5% or less means it's low in this particular item and 20% or more means it's high in this particular item. morning and welcome back to Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit. I'm your host Josie Bidwell and we've been taking your questions today either by email or on the phone lines about health and wellness and we do have a couple of callers on the line so we're going to go down and say hello Sam. How can I help you? Uh, How can you get 3,000 calories a day for your body Mm -hmm. without bad stuff? I mean, what what would you recommend? And the multivitamins, uh, you know, we mm-hmm. do extra on them, and now I'm finding out that maybe we're messing up more stuff by taking it through our vitamins, trying to get our equal nutritional day. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, God. I'm so confused. You're so confused. Well, I'm going to try and help you out, uh, cut through a little bit of the confusion there. The first piece is the 3,000 calories. Where is that number coming from? Um, food. Right, but for that as a goal, has oh, someone oh, told you you need 3,000? Um, well, you ju- I mean, when I was listening to uh-huh. the article, I said uh, that's what I would need to do to get my weight back. So you're trying you to know? gain weight? That's- Yes. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. So making sure we're on the, on the same page there. So in terms of needing to add calories to gain weight, and you're wanting to do that in a healthful way, then we want to look at where, you know, how we're building our plate, right? And at the basis of a good balanced plate, we want to have about half of that plate as fruits and veggies. Now those are relatively low in calories, so we can't just stop there, especially if we're trying That's to gain right. weight, right? Um, right. Uh, but we, we do want to have some of those good, um, healthy uh, fruits and vegetables on there because that's where a lot of the micronutrients are. So a lot of the things you're talking about getting in vitamins um, are going to be in the fruits and vegetables, which is where your vitamin A and your B vitamins and your vitamin C and your potassium and all these things are. So having those is really important, right? And then we want to think about a quarter of that plate being a whole grain or some type of starchy item, whether that be a sweet potato or a baked potato or oatmeal or brown rice or whole wheat pasta or whole wheat bread, something like that. That's going to, again, give you some micronutrients that we're needing, some fiber that we're needing. Um, But then also those are a little bit heavier in calories. So we're going to add some good for us calories back onto the plate. Right. And then the other quarter is where that protein is going to be. And so when we're choosing proteins and we want to add calories in a healthy way, then we want to make sure that we're choosing lean cuts of those and not doing like frying them. Right. Um, Because that's just going to add saturated fat without adding, you know, just good for us calories. So if we're going to do animal based options, then, you know, having um, baked, broiled, grilled um, chicken or fish or seafood, those different types of things. If we're going to do plant based options, that's fine as well. Things like um, 
uh, black beans, pinto beans, black eyed peas, those types of things, uh, making sure that we have some type of protein source at every meal and snack. The other thing when we're working with people on gaining weight is looking at snack time uh, because snacks are something that is an opportunity to add good quality calories and micronutrition back into our diet. So maybe we have a Greek yogurt, which is going to be less sugar, more protein with some fruit and nuts sprinkled on top. That's one of the, the my favorite kind of snacks to recommend for folks who are trying to gain weight because it's good balance, good. good balance nutrition there. Um, thinking about um, how we, you know, our cooking techniques, obviously we don't want to add fat just for the sake of adding fat, but using, you know, some good heart healthy fats like olive oil or avocado oil when we're roasting or grilling um, our vegetables, again, adds some high quality nutrients back, uh, back to our plate that way. Uh, and then um, if you have the option, working with a registered dietitian is going to be the best way to add good nutrients back to your plate while also gaining weight in a healthy way. And so you can find dietitians in your area um, by going to eatright.org and you just put in your zip code and it'll show you dietitians in your area um, that would that you'd be able to, to work with to help you build some of those things out. In terms of government um, and not approving vitamins, you know, a vitamin is fine if that's how you want to go. Obviously, we take a food first approach, but that's not always um, adequate for everyone. I do recommend looking for the USP verified seal on the vitamin um, because that means it's that means it's gone through third party efficacy testing to say what's in the bottle is actually what's in the bottle so if it says it's vitamin D it's vitamin D in that bottle at the uh, potency that is listed on the side of it there very very informative and do you mind one more question sure we got just a few minutes lay it on me Okay, um, well, it's the soup. I don't know what I've done, but if anybody wants to lose weight, those protein drinks, there's a certain kind that I got addicted to uh-huh. thinking it would make me healthier. Mm. I didn't realize I wasn't getting the calories. Yeah, protein it's shakes are usually fairly low. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so it means rice and beans is just- <laughs> basically the best thing. I, I'm know. a big fan of rice and beans. Um, I, I usually have some variety of, of a bean and a whole grain together every day. And, you know, protein shakes can be used um, even for folks who are trying to gain weight. We just usually want to make sure that those are not our sole source of nutrition and that we're also beefing them up. So maybe we're using them as a base to a smoothie that we're also adding um, some fruits and vegetables to. Maybe we're adding a little bit of peanut butter or avocado, something like that, that's going to have um, a bigger bulk of calories to help help flesh that, um, that meal out there. Um, and so it's not the only thing we have. It's just in addition to other things. Yeah, yeah, well, as far as uh, nutritional values, if you're not really eating good stuff for you, um, it, it, I thought it was taken care of us, yeah. you know, nutritionally. That's what I'm after is the best thing for our body. So we need exactly. to and vegetables and fruits. So thanks to me, and you're so informative. Well, Thank I you. appreciate you. Thanks so much for, yeah, for giving us a I listen do today. More than you do. Oh, well, I appreciate you. You have a great rest oh, of your Monday. You do All right. Bye bye. All right, guys, that is going to put a wrap on our show for today. If you didn't get your question or comment in today, you can always send me an email. That email address is fit at mpbonline.org. If you didn't catch the show in its entirety or you just want to go back and listen again or listen to any of our Southern Remedy shows, you can do that by downloading our podcast. Just search for Southern Remedy on your favorite podcasting app. You've been listening to Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit. I've been your host, Josie Bidwell, produced by the wonderful Kevin Farrell. Make sure you tune in every weekday at 11 for the full Southern Remedy lineup.